This is Continuum Drag, a weekly podcast for visiting television, sci-fi, fantasy, and everything in between. This week, Ultraviolet, Episodes 1 and 2. Did they tell you I was evil? It's what the church always says, Mike. Women, black, disabled, gay. Now us. Do you like living in the Middle Ages? Welcome to Continuum Drag. The podcast, Back from Vacation. I'm Luke, here with my co-host Jordan. What's real, Jordan? Ah, oh, I forgot. I forgot to say something. You know what? I had I had weeks and weeks to come up with something that was real. But I guess what's real is that we're back. That's all that matters. Well, uh, what did you do with your time off, Jordan? Did you watch uh, any fun science fiction? I, I, read a, I read a science fiction book I unexpectedly found. What was the book you read? Remember how I said I read a book, Jordan? That's not true. I listened to a book on an audiobook. <laughs> Well, it's it's the same thing, really. I, I remember it the same way. <laughs> I uh, I was really bored, so I just went onto the library app and was just like, "Give me any currently available audiobook," and I ended up listening to Stephen King's The Tommy Knockers. Really? But I got into it. I'm like, "Oh, this is just a weird science fiction novel." <laughs> so how is it? Is it fun? You know what? I had a good time with it once I got into it, but it was so funny because it was like Threshold in that like an alien signal just changes people into aliens. And then it just mixes that with like everybody has like old 1950s ray guns. Mm. So what I'm hearing is because I dislike Threshold, I'll dislike that book. I mean, you are a Stephen King completist though. So it's hard to know. Yeah. I mean, I'll I'll read anything really. (laughs) But uh, yeah, you know what? I would say if you like the kind of tv shows we're watching here eh, you know what why not give it a try right what about you jordan anything fun over the over the summer break the summer break the continued drag summer break we were just talking about uh before we started recording that weirdly three shows that i was watching the last couple weeks all have the same i don't know what you call it same plot point of a giant ball that is essentially predicting the future it's in Westworld, it's in Devs, and it was in uh, Tales for the Loop. Three science fiction shows I was watching, I was like, either this is the, the craziest coincidence or everyone's cribbing from each other. <laughs> There's just like one idea floating around right now and everyone needs a piece of it. Yeah, and it's, and it's the same uh, CGI company that's uh, designing stuff. It's like, like oh, what should, what should this computer look like? They're like, well, I don't know, what a big, big, big ball. I'm like, yeah, perfect. Yeah, we'll find out. Uh, what it probably was is like 18 months ago, Wired wrote an article about uh, algorithms, and now everybody's <laughs> making TV shows out of it. That's right. It's like, this is a great idea. Anyway, science fiction. You could you use some more of it, because that's what we're going to do. But there will be no, there'll be no uh, crystal ball of the future <laughs> in this. We should watch, though. Maybe this year we'll encounter something very similar, and we'll find out this is a trope we just never knew about. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Well, let's get into it then, because... Uh, we're back and we're coming at you with a new series and we're shaking it up a little this time because we're watching a British vampire drama from 1998 called Ultraviolet. But spoiler, they don't say vampire in this and apparently we'll never say vampire. Yes, I believe they're known as Code Fives. Code Fives or what do they call them as like slang? Uh, little ashy boys. I don't remember. <laughs> Leeches. Leeches. That's pretty good. Yeah. I was thinking mine was just like, because they turned to ash, but I was wrong. I thought they looked more like coffee grinds myself, but. <laughs> this uh, series actually was recommended to us by a listener named Drew. He wrote in and was just like, you need to check this out. And you know what? I'm glad he did. Uh, we can get into these first two episodes, but I was just like, we've never done a vampire show. And I know we tend to lean towards science fiction, but we certainly have fallen to the fantasy world a lot too. And watching this, I was just like, man vampires are such a tried and true genre like there's just like all this like all these hard rules all these hard like ideas that you always have to retrofit for every new time you try to tell us a story that i was just like oh man it's really interesting we haven't done this yet because i don't know about you i'm not a huge vampire genre fan no i mean i wouldn't i wouldn't say i was either i won halloween in the 80s i dressed up as dracula 
Right. But I was thinking back on it. I'm just like, I have watched a lot of vampire media, though. Like, I've seen Buffy. I've seen True Blood. So I don't, I don't shy away from it either. So I was just, it was kind of interesting. I'm like, oh, this is a world I know very well, but I've never really, I've, this is the first time we're approaching it on our on our podcast. Well, it does feel like one of those things where it's so ubiquitous and so commonplace that we all know the traditions and the fables and the tropes of vampires that it seems like anytime you have a new property such as this, they try to do a new spin on it. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. And I think that will be a bit of our discussion over the next couple of weeks. But um, this is a, a slightly different take on vampires. It's always interesting because you have to keep certain elements but you also have to make them your own. So it's always, it's fun to see how they're trying to do that on this show, I found. Right. All right, Jordan, before we get into it, the show came out in uh, 1998 between September and October. Uh, only six episodes. It's uh, one of those great British TV shows that runs for a very short period of time and tries not to wear out itself welcome. So we're very grateful for that. I, I can already tell for the first couple episodes, like they just, they go right into it. So not much happened in that period of time, according to my wikipedia around uh, what was happening in the world when this series was out. But here, here's what I got for you. September 24th, 1998, Iran retracts the fatwa against Salman Rushdie. I remember that. Yeah, he was all like, ah, time to go outside. I could use some vitamin D. Here was the quote actually from the government that was, well, the quote that was on Wikipedia, perhaps not the exact quote from the government, but the quote they attributed to the government was, now, neither support nor hinder the assassination operations on Rushdie. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, look, we don't really want to come on either side of this. But we're just going to say, eh, you know, let bygones be bygones. Seems like a real soft retraction. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. I do like it, though. I think that's my new retraction. Everything is like, uh, I neither hate nor like you now. <laughs> <laughs> um, and on October 16th of 1998 was the arrest of uh, Augusto Pinochet. Oh, Pinochet. Oh, yeah. Uh, a lot of a uh, lot of heavy world events while the show is going on, which actually fits the show pretty well. This is a very um, I don't know if serious is the right word. Is serious the right word, Luke? What, how would you what would you call the tone of this? It's not tongue in cheek. It's not it's not an action show. It's it's not a straight drama. It brings a certain level of melodrama, but it does seem to understand it's like needs to be a little tongue in cheek. But it's not a comedy, so I don't know it. it Certainly is done very straight faced, but I didn't find it aggressively like grim or like self serious. Exactly. Yeah, right. All right. Let's get into it. Here's the IMDb summary for episode one Habeas Corpus. When his friend Jack disappears the night before his wedding, Detective Michael Colfield looks into it. This draws him into a world of secret dealings and covert operations. It just so happens there's a war going on between humans. And vampires. And uh, that IMD summary was courtesy of Camus716. Camus, what was the number? Uh, 716. Do you think Camus is the, is, th- there's there's 715 other ones, or that, that number signifies something special for them? Oof. I think there are 715 other ones. <laughs> They're all just uh, uh, big fans of the novel The Stranger? <laughs> uh, it's spelt uh, very differently. <laughs> oh, is it? Oh, okay. It's not Camus? It's, uh, I believe, K-A-M-A-S. <laughs> My mistake. Forget everything I said. (laughs) Well, uh, the episode starts off with a police informant on the run from a heavily tinted car. The windows in this car are very tinted, so you know, got to be vampires inside. Who else needs windows tinted that much? (laughs) Don't you like the things like that where you immediately know just because you've seen so much uh, TV and movies and sort of things? You're like, must be a vampire. Well, I mean, it was either that or a a teenage weed dealer. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right, right. But it wasn't a Honda Civic, so it couldn't be. That's it. That's the sign. And just you just if you're looking for vampires, tinted windows, but make sure it's not a Honda Civic. Uh, this this police informant, he's on his old 1998 cell phone, which was hilarious to see. Technology, it's, it has changed dramatically in this time. Oh, I love it. Um, and uh, he's calling up some cops he knows, the, the ones he snitches to, and they're at their they're at a bachelor party. And this is kind of our lead character, Detective Sergeant Michael Colefield, mm-hmm. and uh, his partner who's getting married and the subject of the bachelor party, Jack. Does Jack ever get a last name? No, I don't believe he does. But uh, and I don't know. Maybe you wouldn't recognize him. But did you recognize the actor who played Jack? I did. You said uh, previously you'd watched True Blood, and I know he's a char- he's an actor in that. I only saw a couple episodes of True Blood, so I knew who he was, but I did think it was funny that, uh, spoiler alert, 
uh, this guy pl- has played two vampires in his career. Yeah, it, it's Stephen Moyer who played Vampire Bill on True Blood. So he went from this vampire show to playing the lead on True Blood much later in his career. When I saw him, I, he was much younger, but I was just like, that guy looks exactly like the guy from True Blood. And sure enough, it was. Except with 1998 hair. Yeah, very long hair. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, Luke, real quick. Is this supposed to be set in the near future? It doesn't seem like it, but I wasn't sure based on some of the technology that they that you eventually see. Oh, interesting. I think it's supposed to be contemporary, but I think okay, it's a slightly different world because there is a war on vampires going on. So perhaps their technology has evolved slightly differently. Or it's just technology we don't see because we don't have vampires. Right, right. <laughs> Fair enough. Just thought I would check. Mike, our lead cop, he's, he's a bit annoyed to be bothered by this informant at the bachelor party because the informant's been sending them photos of a counterfeiting operation he's been following, but uh, all the photos are empty because, you know, tricky vampires can't be photographed. Yeah, and that's something we should really uh, mention all the rules specific to this show. We're, we're going to find out that vampires not only don't show a reflection, but they don't show up in photographs or video cameras in this world either. Yeah. Uh, So they kind of think this informant is full of crap as a result of that. Um, And Mike only finally gives into going to meet the informant when the informant starts weeping openly over the uh, phone begging for help. Yeah, this poor guy, you just know he's destined to get killed. So they they agree to meet at an arcade, um, but unfortunately, before uh, before Mike can get there, a very goateed vampire takes a gun and shoots him in the middle of an arcade while he plays a racing game. It was such an odd looking place. I wasn't sh- I thought at first it was a casino, but it is an arcade. It, but it just was like the the classic like there's just lights and sounds and everything. So I guess that's a good place to assassinate someone. I guess if you don't show up on cameras anyway. It's also funny because the informant, it's not like he's like 20 years old. The informant's like 55 year old man. So it was a, such a strange place to catch up with him playing a racing game as well. Yeah. The goateed uh, uh, presumably vampire uh, walks in, stabs him really quick, and then just and flees. Yeah, and I, I, he actually shoots him. It's it's that violent. But um, oh, is he? Sh- does he shoot him? I thought he stabbed him. Well, that's what I. And I mean, this is just a thing that happens, even in, like anything where someone's invisible because they don't appear on camera and they don't appear on video camera. I just kept thinking, I'm like, shouldn't you see like floating clothes and a floating gun or something? But I guess in this world, you have like a, a there's like a sphere of influence of invisibility. But basically. When he gets shot, it appears as if no one has shot him on the on the video footage. The invisibility in this is much like in, uh, what was that 70s show we watched? Oh, uh, uh, Gemini Man. Gemini Man. It's the same thing. The, the invisibility is slightly outside of the body, so it covers clothing too. Perfect. This is a real Gemini Man situation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At any rate, uh, Mike gets there, finds the dead informant, and kind of goes off on a chase trying to track this vampire down, which he is unsuccessful in doing thanks to his ability to hide in mirrors because he has no reflection. Yeah, they, they he chases him in the subway, and, he, and he's look, using those uh, ra- really large mirror, circular mirrors they have in subways, and he just, he can't see him, and so he loses the guy. Yeah, can't peek around a corner to see if he's there because he's a vampire. <laughs> yeah, I know, he should have just peeked around himself instead of using the mirror. Uh, Meanwhile, his partner, Jack, is uh, quite drunk, kind of going for a wander post-bachelor party. And uh, the goateed vampire appears to him and tells him, time's up. We've got to go. So we know that uh, Jack is in cahoots with this goateed vampire. Mm -hmm. You call him goateed vampire. I just call him goateed guy. Goateed guy. I wasn't sure if he was a vampire at this point. That goatee was very prominent. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's his main defining feature. We cut to the wedding the next day. Apparently, this bachelor party was the day before the wedding. And, uh... Jack's gone missing before his wedding. What I like about this, though, is they realize Jack's not there really late into the day, assuming. Like, no one has checked up to the wedding. Like, his who we're going to find out is his fiance slash, you know, bride-to-be is literally in the car at the church about to get out when they're like, oh, by the way, he's not here. Like, everyone's there. And the ceremony's good to go. It was a weird thing because she's in her gown. And as she gets out, she seems to know he's missing when she gets out because she's just like, oh, those guys from the CIB, the uh, Criminal Investigations Bureau, have been here to look for him. It feels like everyone just kept moving forward with the wedding in the hopes he might just accidentally show up. It was almost as if like this is his usual uh, kind of behavior, but there's no indication that he's ever done anything like this before. It's true. But essentially... Mike starts looking into it. He talks to this fiance, Christy, who he has the hots for, I guess. He has a hots for his partner's fiance. Yeah, they imply that there was a little bit of a love triangle, or at least that he's been pining for her, even though it's his best friend's, you know, relationship. 
she's recently found out that Jack had secret offshore accounts to the tune of like 58,000 pounds and um, may have been in cahoots with these counterfeiting vampires, which we were not sure they're vampires yet, but we're sure. <laughs> yeah, we're not sure they're vampires, but they're vampires. Um, and uh, she's sort of like, I don't know what's going on. He never told me about these bank accounts. She's a little worried. She drove Jack to a life of crime because she kept asking for things he couldn't afford. She's, <laughs> she needs a little bit of a uh, self confidence. I think it's like it's not your fault, lady. He's he's like he's gonna be a vampire. Um, Mike sort of heads home and he sort of notices he's being followed around by these weird agents, these CIB agents who are, are seem to be tracking him and trying to find old uh, old Jack and wherever he's gone. And when he gets into his apartment, Jack's waiting for him and tells him, I need you to lose those men who are following you and come and meet me at this abandoned playground so I can tell you what's really going on. Now, I know why they do these sorts of things, because it looks more interesting and it, it, uh, it gives you some anticipation of what's going to come. But like, if I just showed up at your place and was like, hey, Luke, I'm going to tell you something, but I'm going to go tell you later. Meet me at night at this abandoned park. Like, you're not going to want to show up there. It did feel, I was just like, just tell me now. We're already here. You've already snuck into my house. Yeah, I I, I mean, uh, he just, he doesn't like closed quarters or something. But anyways, it doesn't, the, the important point, it's going to look much better in the park. I mean, the abandoned park between those two old, uh, old skyscrapers did look pretty good. Yeah, right. But essentially what he says is he's in trouble because he he was slightly involved with the counterfeiters but these people who are claiming to look for him from the cib they're gonna murder him if they find him and he just can't get caught so he needs mike to look into what's really going on and get to the bottom for him before he gets murdered yeah they basically set it up that you as a viewer are not really supposed to be sure at this point who you're supposed to be supporting because the cib agents up to this point are shown to be a little bit shady and mysterious and so is jack so you're you're not quite sure who you're rooting for who you're rooting for i wrote down cib more like mib <laughs> well played and a timely reference too they're uh, they're very much sort of like off the beaten path of like government agencies because even mike's boss is just like hey just just go along with whatever they want because i don't know who they are they're not who they say they are but they have a lot of clout yeah and uh, do you want to talk about kind of who our two lead agents for, uh, who, are, who are trying to track down Jack are? There's Dr. Angela Marsh. Her specialty is blood, right? That we're going to yes, find out? She's, uh, she's a hematologist whose uh, husband and kid were drowned in an automobile accident. That's right. So that's her backstory. And then we have another one, which is uh, Von Rice. Von Rice. Good name. It is a good name. Played by... Played by Idris Elba, who clearly since this show has ran, is, has become the biggest star of this show. At least the, the most recognizable, I think. It's true. Uh, it was. It, this is one of the selling points from the email from our, our friend Drew. He's just like, it's got Idris Elba in it. And I'm like, yeah, right. I'll check out Idris Elba in an early show. And and he does look a little bit younger, but it's clearly him. It really is a prelude to Luther. Like, you can see yeah. exactly why they would hire him for a Luther later with this show. Mm-hmm. And he's ex-military who retired after his entire squad was killed in a friendly fire incident. So we know these people aren't on the level. But when you hear that sort of thing, when they said that, the first thing I thought, I was like, so he killed everybody? A friendly fire? Like he accidentally killed everyone in his team if he's the only one that survived? I think that is the thing. I think that's what you're supposed to think. Oh, okay, good. Then then, then I'm not alone. (laughs) Um, Anyway, Mike... Is a little off put by them so he's continuing his own like side investigation into what happened to that night what happened to jack what happened to that informant he think you know obviously it must all be tied together so he finds a eyewitness who just happens to also be a street caricature artist who draws him a picture of the vampire man since he doesn't appear on camera it works out were you disappointed uh that the caricature artist on the street didn't draw him like the goateed vamp on like roller skates holding a blood martini or something <laughs> that is funny have you ever had one of those done I did. A friend of mine and I went to Amsterdam and uh, there was a man just on the street and my friend's like, we got to do one. And we sat there for 20 minutes while he drew a ridiculously large head caricature of uh, me and my friend. Did he pick anything specific about you that like that made you feel bad about yourself? I think he really emphasized uh, my ears and my glasses. (laughs) Right. I I had it uh, done when I was a kid. I don't remember the, the circumstances, but I remember, uh, you know, you you sit down and the guy says, oh, what do you like? And my mom was there. So instead of, you know, 
me getting to say anything I actually like. My mom was like, he plays violin. <laughs> so the guy's like, that's great. And so he drew me sort of like Huckleberry Finn with like, uh, like overall ripped overalls and stuff. And I'm playing a violin. And then he put a dog covering its ears because the, like the noise was so bad. It was like scratchy notes and stuff. And I was horribly, horribly offended. <laughs> <laughs> Did you used to play violin? Yeah, I was like, I was like seven or something. Oh, yeah, I wish I could have heard it. Yeah. Covering my ears from the screeching sounds. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Your gigantic comical ears that that guy drew. Anyway, this this sketch of the goateed vampire leads him to look through the criminal database of photos, and he finds a photo that matches kind of the caricature of this guy. So he takes that photo from the database and tracks him down to the last known address of this, this I guess he's a criminal in their database. And what he kind of finds here is the goatee vampire's house, which is full of counterfeit money and 1998 Photoshop on computers. Yeah. And he's sort of looking over what I guess is a some big counterfeit ring for cash. Not what I expected. I thought they were going to be counterfeiting jeans or something, but cash works too. Yeah. And as he's looking around, the vampire comes home, at which point I was like, oh, we're going to get a confrontation between uh, Mike and this vampire. But what happens next like, was chaotically insane, but I enjoyed it. Yeah, you're right. You They set up like, oh no, these two are going to have a confrontation. They're going to have a fight. But then at that exact moment, a like military SWAT-esque sort of team breaks in all suited up with guns and smoke bombs and like they're they've apparently picked the exact same time that they're going after goatee guy yeah it's led by avon rice and and they're busting in they're blowing away this vampire who ex- who explodes in like a flash of light like a vampire does in these shows and they've got gas grenades with air with aerosolized garlic bullets that have carbon pointed tips because I guess that's like a steak because it's like you've burnt the wood to carbon and now it's a it's a bullet. Well, it's it, but it's a special vampire bill is what you need to know. It's interesting. I like the idea that they've like this is their stakes on this show. Like instead of staking them, you have a bullet made of carbon um, and th- all their guns are mounted with video cameras. I was going to say, and also in the next episode, and this is not a spoiler, you get a suit up scene where you get uh, Von Rice's character and he's like putting the whatever you call them not garlic bullets or whatever but he's putting them into the gun he's getting all this stuff ready and it's that classic suit up scene but this time with vampire related stuff nice nice did you initially understand why the guns had video cameras and like little video viewing screens like a camcorder on them i didn't they sort of explained that later but i actually didn't even catch it until later on i was like oh i understand because they're worried they can't they want to they want to double check to make sure the person's a vampire before they blow them away Yeah, I thought at first that they had some sort of special vampire sensor on there and then later realized I'm like, oh, you just point the camera at someone and if they don't appear, you can shoot them. Well, I mean, if it ain't broke, you know, it's a simple solution. And I actually quite liked it when I realized how it worked. I'm like, yeah, great. You just like look at someone not there. You can shoot the like open fire. Anyway, as this sort of like giant raid is happening downstairs, Mike kind of runs through the house and he, uh, he seems to steal one of these guns. Like he, there seems to be just one laying on the ground. I don't think it makes much sense. Like they don't seem to know he's there, and he seems to be sneaking around stealing their stuff. I felt like he probably could have just sn- snuck out of the house. But a much better way to get out of a house, and a much more dramatic way to get out of the house, is we cut to him jumping out of a second-story window, glass exploding everywhere into a river, and I was just like, "Good exit." Yeah, and it it was funny because it was like he wasn't like he was being chased or he needed to get out at that point like he could have just hid or just probably walked out but i love he's just like i gotta get out of here there's only i see a river there's only way in one way i can see it's a good action movie moment where it's just like a window explodes and a man flies out of it i was just like whoa here we go and then they get the shot of the team and they're basically like what just happened who is this guy what was that <laughs> what was that why is there so much up through the window um Mike's now very suspicious of these these agents who are following him and who they are. So he, he decides he's going to follow March, the doctor, and see kind of where she's going, what she's up to, and sort of follows her back to what I guess is the headquarters for their team, which is a, a church full of uh, the Roman numeral five on all the walls. That seems fine. This is their first indication of what uh, what we're going to come to know as the code fives for the vampires. And uh, as he's sort of exploring this uh, this church, trying to figure out what's going on, uh, Rice appears and puts him under arrest and kind of drags him off to an interrogation room to meet meet the boss of this uh, anti-vampire squad. Mm-hmm. 
Did you get the name of their boss? Yeah, the boss's name is Father Pierce J. Harmon, right? That's right. Do they mention at this point that he's a, a priest? I think they introduce him as a priest, yes. Okay, because I know they mention it later, but I think I must have missed it now. Because I was later on, I was like, wait a minute, the guy's a priest? And I was like, oh, that all makes sense. But I, I think I missed it at this point. But anyways, that's what you need to learn is that there's some sort of connection, obviously, to either the church or at least there's a religious connection to this this group. Yeah, they're they're working on behalf of the Vatican. Uh, they're paid for by the government now, but they're the Vatican's sort of in charge of this elite uh, secret squad of vampire hunters. They used to be known as the Inquisition. <laughs> but they were like, nah, two on the nose. <laughs> At any rate, Father Pierce is kind of talking to Mike. And he's like, hey, listen, your friend Jack, he actually died three nights ago. And like, he's not who you think he is. And Mike's just like, hey, I don't believe any of this stuff. And the priest is just kind of like, hey, if you don't believe it yet, no worries. Let him go and let him find out what's going on on his own. And they kind of just release him into the wild so he can go meet Jack again and I guess confirm his suspicions that this is all like much more supernatural than he thinks. Mm-hmm. And we, we head back to that abandoned playground. This time he's got that video camera gun. So when he confronts Jack, he can see he has no image. And Jack kind of explains everything that's really going on finally. We get the sort of first idea of what's happening is Jack was working for the counterfeiting vampires and he couldn't risk going to jail for corruption. So when he was when he knew he was going to get caught, he agreed to become one of the vampires. And he kind of starts explaining what I guess is going to be a, a core issue of the show. He's just like, hey, vampires aren't bad. The church is bad. Like this is an ethical gray area. You you have to you have to believe me and not side with the church on this. And he makes a very good point about like the vampires just don't want to be exterminated. They're just trying to survive. And, like, and he's like, how could you trust the church? The uh, church has a terrible track record with uh, with who they who they like and don't like. And he, he cites uh, women, black people, disabled people, and gay people. It's a, it's a an argument you could beat down in a debate pretty easily. But in terms of this show and, and uh, him talking to his friend, he makes a pretty good, uh, pretty good case for his side. It's an interesting, it's it definitely establishing it for a pilot just like, oh, uh, these may seem like, you know, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, cool guys, but you know what? Vampires are pretty cool too. (laughs) That would have been better if he's like, hey, I know those guys look cool and they got those camera guns, but guess what? Vampires are cool too. Watch this. He actually uh, offers Mike a job saying, hey, why don't you work for us? Work for the cool vamps. You can be our inside man, letting us know what's going on in the police force. And he kind of tries to sweeten the deal for Mike by saying, hey, and if you do it, you know, I, I can't come back, so you, you could maybe hang out with my fiancé a little. But the the pure mention of Christy uh, sends Mike into a rageful spiral, and they get into a bit of a, a tussle now. Mm-hmm. I had to re- rewatch it a few times, but what I think happens is, is this where he he mentions Christy, it irritates him so much, he opens fires and shoots Jack. Yes, he shoots Jack in the chest with the uh, vampire-killing gun. Yeah, Jack falls over, and he's like, oh, I just killed my friend, goes over to him, and then he sees that Jack was smart enough to have worn a bulletproof vest, so it didn't kill him, and then they start tussling, and they're grabbing each other, and then I'm assuming he got this also in the raid, but while they're tussling, he pulls out a, gr- sorry, uh, Mike pulls out a grenade, and Jack's like, don't do that, and it, and then there's this really weird sequence where I'm like, he very only almost kills himself, he basically drops the grenade, kicks it, and then Jack goes to pick it up, essentially. I think that's correct, and he and it explodes. Yeah, that's basically it. Jack is caught in the grenade explosion, but as a vampire, is unkilled by grenades. He looks like he's been injured, and then what he sees is, because of the um, the explosion, some sort of shrapnel or something has, has gone into him, so it's always sticking out of his side, some piece of wood or metal or something. And so when they start tussling again, uh, Mike starts like, moving that around it's almost like he's being staked jordan wood or metal or something he's a vampire okay well i just i'm just saying it it, i couldn't quite tell i'm it most likely is wood (laughs) (laughs) but yeah they they start like i guess they get in the final conflict here because mike's trying to jab that stake that wooden shrapnel further into uh jack's body Jack's leaning down and like giving him a hickey on the side of his neck, classic vampire style. Yeah, and then what what basically happens is 
Mike pushes him off. He's been bitten. His he's been uh, he has little fang marks in his throat. But the injuries are too much for Jack, and he sort of starts lighting up, and he just explodes. I mean, this is something that happens in every show. Is like you got to come up with a new way to signify the death of a vampire. Mm-hmm. I- I'm going to describe to you how I felt this one looked, and then you can tell me if you liked or disliked this. Okay. Uh, essentially, when Jack dies, he kind of vaporizes. It. It's it looked to me kind of like the rapture like a huge column of white light appears around him and like seems to shoot straight up in the sky and then there's a bit of a shock wave and all that's left is like ashes or i guess you thought coffee grounds on the ground that uh, are also kind of burning still yeah i I thought it was actually a pretty good effect I i wrote down that it was like a mini supernova oh that's pretty good that's a good description but it's that same yeah it's the same thing there's a big bright light um it's it's not a gory thing you don't see body parts blow up it's it's more that they have uh like been cremated in a way yeah yeah it was i was like that's a pretty decent effect for what was clearly like not the biggest budget uh production going on they they did a good job with like what they had no and we, and we should mention that really isn't i don't think uh the strength of the show and i don't think that's what they want the show to be this is not This has action sequences and this has special effects, but that's not really the selling point of the show. The selling point, I think, is the story and the characters. And it's a little bit more of a not a quieter show, but that's not uh, that's not the selling point. I I agree. I think I think you're right. It's trying to be a little more grounded and a little less action. Mike now his his neck is drenched in blood from the bite he received. Um, And of course, he uh we get a little sequence here where he wanders around trying to figure out if he's like we he, he, nothing's ever explicitly stated but he kind of wanders around waiting for dawn to come he tries to go to a church but feels sick when he sees it so he can't go in yeah and then when the sun finally comes up he doesn't burst into flames so he goes to see a doctor about the the wound on his neck and when the doctor washes all the blood away there's no fang marks so it's as if nothing has happened he just has blood all over his neck yeah, the doctor's like, are you sure you got bit? Because the only blood on, on this is from someone else. So it's it's healed quickly. And I think we, we hear later on, I think Angela in the next scene or two tells him, I think it takes like 10 minutes to heal or something like that when you get bitten by a vampire. Right. He ends up going to see Rice and March, the agents now, just because I guess he doesn't know where else to go. And she's got a uh, kind of light that she shines on his neck. And what we see in the ultraviolet light that's on this device is he's just got a big red rash on his neck. And this is one of those vampire mythology things that they're repurposing for their uses. Is I guess what has happened is, as is explained to him, is they've now marked him. Like, he is now susceptible to suggestion from vampires. So I guess what it is, it's like giving them a little imperceptible rash. It's like Dracula's mesmerism, I guess. Yeah, they, they keep mentioning that he's been infected. And it's it's not that uh, he's become a vampire. It's just, as you're saying, they've been marked and now... They are people who get marked are sort of used as pawns by vampires in this world. Thankfully, the vampire annihilation squad, they they know that you can use a little bit of a laser to uh, burn it off your skin. And then you're I guess you're cleared of the mark of Dracula and uh, you end up with just a scar on your neck, which is like a thing we've seen throughout the episode is March and uh, Rice. They both are walking around with like weird scars in their neck, but it was hard to say what it was. Yeah. So everyone's got matching scars now. They're a team. Did you like that? I think next episode, someone sees uh, Mike's scar and says, hey, did you get a hickey or something? And I'm like, that scar looks nothing like a hickey. Yeah, no, it, you know what it looks like? It looks like a vampire bite that's uh, being burned slightly. He's basically now invited to join the vampire squad because uh, as Father Price puts it, they could really use an investigator type on the team. They've kind of got their strong man in Rice and they've got their science person in uh, March, but they could use an investigator. And here we kind of get... A little bit of a mythology drop with some more information around kind of what's going on in this world. Like, for instance, March tells him about uh, religion and holy water and how it is only effective on vampires who are superstitious or like believe in religion. She puts it as a placebo effect. So this idea is now presented in the show that maybe like traditionally vampires are evil and uh, God is good. But this show is now proposing perhaps a world without a God. But uh, religion still is effective because of a placebo effect? Yeah, it's basically like uh, we know about vampire traditions and vampires also know about vampire traditions. So if they believe that uh, they will they can't get into a church, they're not going to be able to get into a church. And, and I actually thought that was a 
pretty good way of uh, of of getting around some sort of rules and and making it their own. I, I I thought it was pretty well done. Yeah, I didn't mind it either. I thought it was an interesting take and um, kept the idea of religion involved without like saying religion is true or real. Like they're they're taking a different spin on it. They're really trying to ground this in like a very true to the time period 1998. I felt like the other little mythology bits we learn is they've collected Jack's ashes from the site where he died. And they put them in like a little metal, metal cylinder and go into this room full of ultraviolet light. And they have like vaults and they slide the cylinders in and lock them up in a vault. And they've got all the vampires they've ever killed in there. Because apparently in this universe, a vampire can regenerate from ash form back to human form or back to like vampire form. And they have to keep them locked away in this ultraviolet room so that doesn't happen. They don't mention how long it takes, but basically, even though it looks like you've killed them, eventually they're going to reform. I mean, it doesn't, again, it's not clear how long it's going to take, but so what they do is they take these little uh, soil or coffee grounds or burnt embers and they put them in little tubes and it looks, the room looks a little bit more like a high tech, uh, a containment field from like Ghostbusters or something where they just, they put everything in and that, that's where, that's where they keep their vampires. That's their, uh, that's their Ghostbusters vault. I can't remember what they called it in Ghostbusters. What was it called in Ghostbusters? The containment unit. Yeah, exactly. Let me mention one quick thing. And this is more of a question for you. At the beginning of this episode, this team, the vampire team, whatever you want to call them, vampire hunter team, they're only really interested in Mike because they want to find out more about Jack. Yes. But then by the end of the episode, they're like, hey, by the way, we also could use you. Do you think that they also were, were already interested in him to begin with? Or it's just like a happy coincidence that he's now useful I think it's a happy coincidence because there is implications in this episode and the next that Rice only works there because his squad was turned into vampires during Desert Storm and he had to kill them all. And that March only works there because, yes, she is a blood doctor, but her kid and her husband were turned into vampires and they had and she had to kill them or be involved in their death. They seem to just recruit from people. They don't want to tell people new information. They just recruit right. people who have encountered vampires. Right. That's my assumption anyway. Right. Yeah. So that's probably right. And what I liked is because they're inviting him to join the team. You're going to be our investigator. And uh, Father Pierce kind of wraps up the episode by like kind of they're, they're, you know, Mike has a lot of questions and he kind of gets told like they're so heavily involved in hunting these vampires because the vampires seem to be getting more organized. And this is a very sudden occurrence. Before this, they weren't an organized threat, but now they're becoming one. And uh, Father Pierce puts it this way is that. He feels like this is happening because humans seem to be on a path of self-destruction and that our, quote, free range days are over. (laughs) That's good. I appreciated that we don't like I liked the little tease of a mystery. It's like nobody quite knows what the vampires are up to. And this is unusual behavior. But the implication being like, you know, humans are now getting too powerful. And as a food source, we, they've got to like kind of turn them into like more docile cows or something. Like, I don't know. It was a nice tease. I don't know everything that's going to happen. I don't, don't really have much perspective on the vampire's viewpoints yet. But like, we're getting a tease of what's to come. I think the only thing left in the the episode is, is this sort of, I would almost say C plot of uh, Christy and Mike, their sort of relationship, which I'm assuming is going to run through these six episodes, which is he has to go tell her that, uh, He's trying to he's trying to cover for Jack basically that not only that he killed Jack but that he was a vampire and he's like yeah uh, he was on the take so uh, don't worry about him right 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 I mean that's definitely going to be I think a through line is there's always going to be like a c plot about what's Christy up to yeah <laughs> and what's she up to she's still gardening <laughs> all right should we do episode two yeah let's do it all right here's the IMDb summary for episode two in nominee Patris I don't know how I'm going to pronounce all this Latin stuff I don't know how. <laughs> Yeah, it's great. I only take those who want to go. That is a lie. He begged my mother to go with him. She refused. And you think she made the wrong decision? Well, you'd have to ask her that. My five-year-old daughter didn't choose to go. They don't just recruit, they kill. You're the ones running the extermination program. You're like Nazis. Just because they're different. They're entitled to fight back. It's war. A car runs down a woman on a motorcycle. The investigation leads Coalfield to Danny Ashford, a banker for the vampires, and thence to a small part of the vampires' plan. That was courtesy of Camus 716. 
What I liked about that was a banker to the vampires. What a job. I, you didn't like Vents? <laughs> well, I just, I like banker to the vampires. That's good. It is good. It is good. And that's basically where the episode begins. We meet Danny Ashford, banker to vampires, as she visits her elderly and Alzheimer's afflicted mother in a home. Mm-hmm. She's there, I guess, to say goodbye to her mom is the idea. They're, her wealthy vampire client, Lester Hammond, is waiting in the car. And this is kind of her last moments before she herself will turn her, turn into a vampire, I guess. There seems to be some indication she's about to transition from human to vampire via her wealthy vampire client. But the best part of these scenes, and maybe my favorite character in this, this episode, was the snarky nurse. <laughs> <laughs> It's like this woman who just could not hold back her uh, her disdain for the people, the parents that come visit the uh, the uh, the sorry the kids that come visit their parents at at the home. She's just like, oh, you finally visited, did you? Must be nice. I've been here wiping your mom's ass all day. <laughs> I just she was great. That was very funny. She is in the she just pop up a couple times in the episode being like, these rich people, they don't know how to take care of their parents. Yeah, she's just grumpy, and I love that. I was like, she's just a grumpy person. Danny and uh, Lester are, are driving through the city on their way back, I guess, or back to the city, I guess, from this home. It's unclear. Uh, but dawn is breaking. But of course, they're in one of these heavily tinted cars that we've seen the vampires drive. And I was a little confused by what happened here because they're driving. There's some construction on the highway, I guess. There's a, a young couple riding, a, driving a motorcycle in front of them. And I guess just because they're rich assholes, they're mad that this bikes going so slow but essentially what kicks off the whole episode what basically puts everything in motion is they try to run this couple on a motorcycle off the road i know why there was a little bit of confusion too it, it's the way it's shot is a little bit weird and you don't quite get all the shots you need but that that is what happened they're basically like we don't have time for these people and they sort of run them off the road but the problem is is that they keep driving and get to a um railroad crossing so they're they're then stuck at the railroad crossing and and of course, the bike is there too. And this guy, this weird guy who rides a motorbike with a little mustache, has incredible road rage. I really like this guy. I, it was not what I was expecting from a biker in this, though. He's kind of like a chubby little 20 year old with a mustache. He was like adorable. <laughs> yeah, he's a little bit of a nebbish man. And he, and he, uh, he gets very angry and he sort of wants to start a fight. And he's, um, he goes out. They're all at the, um, the railroad crossing together. And he's yelling at the car clearly the other people don't want to get out of the car because it's sunlight and so he has i think he has a crowbar or something like that and he starts hitting the car to try to get the guy out and eventually hits a window and smashes it and light shines in and of course burns a vampire oh yeah old lester uh, old lester's on fire so he grabs uh, he grabs daddy and tells her to drive she just drives directly into the motorcycle where uh, motorcycle man's girlfriend is still sitting on top of it and runs her down <laughs> Yeah, and it's one of those things where you think like, oh, yeah, it hit her. But like, it's a plot point later. Like, she is really hurt. Like, hurt oh, to the point yeah. of like, she's paralyzed. Yes, she has been paralyzed by this. And that essentially puts our team of vampire hunters on the case because they start looking into an abandoned car found on the side of kind of like a tunnel, like an automotive tunnel with a, a badly burnt interior seat full of ashes, but not enough ashes because... They know the vampire's not dead. There's some ashes, but not enough for a dead vampire. They know that he probably was smoking a cigar. <laughs> um, they're like, we've got to track down whoever this was. Let's look into the car's registration. Let's figure out who this vampire was. And what they kind of come to find out is that Lester Hammond is the uh, son of a very wealthy man. And, and he himself is known as a bit of a playboy uh, who uh, ne'er do well? He's a bit of a ne'er do well who's in the ri the rich scenes of the world. So they go to interview his father Gideon, um, and Gideon kind of tells them, "Oh, I know my son's bad news. I cut him off a long time ago. I have, I have no I have no stakes in his life anymore." Yeah, and they don't quite buy this. They're like, "We know that vampires often will turn a son to take advantage of a father, like those kind of things." They're very good manipulators. So they like they'll pick a lesser member and not pick the most obvious targets. So they're like, seems likely this is the case. And what I liked is like Father Pierce kind of like lays out what this episode is about when he's like, they're talking about the case and what's going on. He's just like, this case is all about the money. We're going to learn about how vampires move money about in their underground circles. And true to his word, this is a purely financial crime investigation. <laughs> yeah. And actually, when I was watching this episode and I realized that was what the plot was going to be, my note is Luke is going to love this episode. You know what? I did. 
I knew you were going to love it. I knew if there's one thing you want, you want to know the inner workings of the financial system of vampires. I love a white collar crime. I don't care about a drug deal. Show me a white collar crime. <laughs> yeah. I, I should mention real quick, though, this gives you, I think, the tone, at least I think, of what the show is going to be like going forward. The pilot's obviously the pilot, which is it's going to be a slightly serialized B story that Christy and and uh, Mike's relationship and that sort of thing and, and learning about the team. But I think it's going to be more about like a weekly track down a vampire kind of show. Yeah, I think it's definitely going to be a little more in the sort of investigator, solve the crime sort of thing. And it seems to be the case here. It's like, this is all about stakeouts. This is all about follow the money. Mm -hmm. This is very much a um, procedural style episode. Yeah. Um, But yeah, so they start digging into the family's banking history. This leads them to that banker, Danny, who was in the car. And they learn about how the family was trading in the, quote, futures market. Which is some sort of wild west of investing. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Gideon, the rich father, calls up his uh, banker, Danny, and tells her to sell all his holdings in the future market and turn it into cash. And of course, you know, they're sort of paying attention to the transactions. They're like, oh, they're they're pulling some moves in the bank accounts right now. And we have to keep an eye on what they do with that cash because it's probably going to end up with our vampire Lester. And do they imply something that because they're vampires, they're able to trade stocks in a different way is that that's implied isn't it but i didn't quite understand how that worked i don't know if that was implied uh there was a sequence like in this sequence when there's they're doing a lot of phone calls back and forth between Gideon and the banker and lester and the banker are talking about selling these futures and there's like some special place you can go to buy and sell them that's unregulated i think that's why they do it there right right the one thing i learned that was new vampire mythology in this thing was because you know we know now they can't be videotaped and they can't appear in photos. They also introduced the idea that if Lester wants to call Danny, the phone is a electric device. And so vampire voices can't travel over a phone. So he has to use voice to text on his computer in order to talk on a phone. I actually kind of like that. I thought it was a, I, like, I don't know how it's really going to, if it's going to be a plot point later on, but I thought it was an interesting thing to add. I mean, I guess just they have trouble with technology. So I'm assuming like they can't get on the internet properly and stuff either. I will say I'd never seen that in a vampire thing before, but like on a purely A to B level, like the idea that you can't photograph a vampire or he doesn't appear on camera. Of course, why would his voice appear on a, you can't, you can't recreate the image of it. And a phone is nothing but a recreation of, of your voice. Like for instance, a vampire could never have a podcast. <laughs> exactly. And I'm glad the vampires found a way around it. They use that voice to text, but um, it's not the, the most effective means. What you really want to do is meet someone in an abandoned park face to face. That's how you want to have a conversation with a vampire. That's the way to do it. It's more intimate. It's more personal. It's yeah. the way to go. Yeah. At any rate, now the team's kind of like on to this whole sale of money. There's going to be a handoff because obviously Lester needs a bunch of money now. This is They're like, all right, all we got to do is follow Danny around. When she does the handoff, we'll catch them both. Case closed. But for whatever reason, Mike is not really on board with this idea, or he feels like maybe this is some sort of distraction. I never quite fully understood it, but Mike is very antagonistic to the rest of the group and doesn't quite like their plan to catch the vampire. Yeah, I think they're still playing with the idea that he's not entirely on board. Like, he's joined the team, but he's not quite with them yet so he's not sure about their methods and stuff and that he still has some some ways to go before he's he's really on board but you're right it didn't quite make sense what his issue was it's like he was just like we got to do it my way and it's like why like they seem to know what they're doing yeah i guess the idea i think at the heart of it is mike is the investigator and as a police officer he's better at maybe seeing clues than they are because what kind of happens is While they're surveilling Danny the banker, he notices she has a burn on her arm. And he's like, oh, if she has a burn on her arm, maybe she was in the car with Lester when he lit on fire after the car accident. So maybe we should look into what's going on with Lester. And so he starts looking into Danny, looking to Lester. He finds like photos of um, of Lester as a teenager. And when he's looking at them, he's just like, hey, didn't that biker guy say that he had blue eyes? In all these photos, he has brown eyes. What could that mean? Mm-hmm. He shows his chops. He does. And they, and they head off and they, they're like, let's go interview Danny's mother at the home because the home is in between here and where the car was found. And if she was in the car with Lester the Vampire, 
maybe they were there. And so they go and they kind of do some digging around and they kind of discover the mom can't tell them anything, but she's got a lot of files there. And the nurse doesn't care about giving them access to personal information because she's a jerk. Yeah, she don't care about anything. She's great. And they kind of discover that Danny's mom was also a vampire or not a vampire. Sorry, was also a banker. Yeah, that's right. And she's handled banking for the same family for like, this is like, these are generational bankers. They've been banking for the same family for generations. Mm -hmm, Right. Which is a weird concept, but sure. And it's it's one of these weird things where you just go, okay, sure, I'll buy it. Because it's going to obviously work out in a way later as the episode goes. But it was one of those like, hold on. The dad works as a banker, then his son's the his son's the other investment person, and you work as the personal investment, and your mom also worked for it? I'm like, sure, okay, why not? So her mom, the banker, when she was still a banker, invested Lester's grandfather's money, and it turns out, looking at her diaries, they also had an affair together, and well, well, old Mike is looking at photos from, like, their youth together, he notices, hey, doesn't Lester look just like his grandfather? And wait, he has the same color eyes. Big reveal. It's a grandpa vampire. Yeah, and I, I actually like this reveal. Basically, the whole time they think the son is the vampire, but then they find, no, it's actually the grandfather. It's just that he hasn't aged so long, so now he's playing the role of the son because he's, he's the appropriate age in vampire time. And I was like, yeah, sure, I didn't see that coming. I actually thought they also handled it very well. Like the, the, the turn that it's the son is the grandfather and then Gideon's in the middle, like this this rich guy whose dad has lorded over him his whole time because his dad never ages. It, it did work. I didn't see it coming. And you know what? It was a, I agree. It was a fun little twist in the thing. And then I loved writing down Vamp Gramp. Yeah. Vamp. Oh, and I should mention one thing. I think it's later on in the episode. They just cast it off really quickly because I think they're like, well, what happened to the actual uh, son? And they're like, oh, he died of a drug overdose. Yeah. Dude. So the grandpa just took his place. It's just like, don't worry about him. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It was just a very like, uh, wash that away. Oh, he died. Don't worry about it. Yeah, it all worked out. Don't worry. We got a new vampire to play him. It's fine. Now that they now that they're on to this, uh, this grandfather, what's his deal? They, they head back to the bank and look into the grandfather's investments who they're like, oh, this grandfather is like 95 years old. And I guess he's still alive. What What is he investing in? And one of the bankers explains like, oh, typical old people stuff, a lot of charitable inv- investments. He really gives a lot of money to this organization that does research into blood disorders called the Beacon Institute. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if vampires are investing in blood disorders, something's up. <laughs> Yeah. And it wasn't what I thought when when I heard that what I was sure what it was going to be was a sort of um, like you've probably seen before, like I thought it'd be people strapped down with tubes and they're having all their blood extracted from them. And it's sort of like a, a commercial factory of producing blood. But that's not it, what it is. No, it's legitimately a vampire testing facility where they're trying to cure blood disorders. But they're just doing it very unethically. Like the people who have disorders are there and they're just torturing them with like radiation therapy, just trying whatever they can to find a cure. But it's it's no scientific method involved. They want to cure diseases because they want their food supply to remain pure because they don't want to get sick or have what they eat be tainted. While all this is going on, this sort of side investigation Mike's running, Rice is still setting up his SWAT team, his classic SWAT team. That's his thing. Mm-hmm. He's uh, going to head off to that money handoff and try to try to catch old Lester with Danny when the money happens. But of course, when Danny goes to drop off the money, she just meets with Gideon, the uh, the rich dad, and uh, Grandpa never shows up. Um, but who does show up at this uh, estate for the money handoff? Well, he sort of shows up at the, the worst time ever. It's old uh, mustache motorbike guy. And old Tubby sort of, uh, I don't know exactly what happens, but he's going to, I guess, confront Gideon and the family because, as we're going to find, his wife slash girlfriend, I'm not sure what their relationship is, who's been injured in the motorbike attack, uh, motorbike accident, is horribly, horribly injured and they he wants them to pay for it. I don't know if it was physically or monetarily, but while he's coming out of the forest, he sort of trips over... Does he trip over someone in the SWAT team or he just he just gets in the way? Yeah, I, I think he just kind of stepped on a branch and they were alerted to his presence. Yeah, which kind of the jigs up as it is. Yeah, so they grab him and he kind of explains how he tracked them down via the insurance. and He wanted to confront them about this terrible thing. And while they're doing this, uh, Danny and Gideon inside are like, oh, hey, what's all the commotion on my lawn? And essentially their cover is blowing. And 
since they're there anyway and they've been made, they take the opportunity to arrest the banker Danny and kind of like ransack Gideon's house looking for clues about uh, where Gramp Vamp has gone and uh, what's going on. Yeah. What I found interesting, though, because at this point, what we have is they've gotten to the bottom of this sort of vampire testing facility on these blood disorder people. So the agency has stopped what's happening there. So that's a win. They didn't catch Lester, but they've now like arrested the banker for helping vampires launder mo- or like launder money, move their money around, whatever. And they've had a confrontation with Gideon and discovered basically his son died at some point and his grandfather or his, this man's father has been alive for 95 years and took over his place. And I'm just like, okay, this is where we are in the episode. Cut to they're back at the agency and they're like, well, that's a wrap on this case. I guess he got away. And I was just like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> and truly, truly, it's like Mike himself is also like, wait, this is it. We're, we're stopping the case now. Like the guy got away and Rice is like, hey, we did a pretty good job. We stopped the banking. We did this other stuff. We can't catch them all. Uh, why don't I take you out for a beer? And uh, Mike's quite upset. But Rice is like, don't worry so hard about it. Uh, that vampire grandpa, remember how he got burnt? He's going to be in a lot of pain for the rest of his immortal existence. So that's a win. Yeah, and that's right. And that's what we learn is that vampires apparently in this world can regenerate, but they can't heal themselves, I guess, to the way that you think they would be able to. So because he's been burned, he's going to stay burned forever. And I guess the implication is his nerve endings are still registering this pain. So he's going to be like a burn victim for the rest of his life and he'll never be able to die. Yeah, it's crazy. Although how do they come back from ashes then? I had a lot of questions. I know it doesn't quite make sense, but maybe they'll answer it in episode five or something. There was a hot second where I thought the episode was going to wrap up here, but there's like a little denouement on this whole story because I know they know the audience is worried about, hey, what's going on with uh, motorcycle boyfriend and motorcycle girlfriend? (laughs) That's right. Yeah. And we did have a few scenes where we've seen, I think Mike goes to visit her in the hospital and that's when we find out she's paralyzed. She sort of has her neck braced and she clearly can't move in the hospital bed. Yeah. We, we follow vampire boyfriend as he goes back to his apartment or his flat, as you might say. <laughs> well done. Your Latin is great and your English uh, idioms. Uh, when he gets back to his apartment, of course, he finds a grandpa vampire waiting for him to murder him. I, I don't know why. What what what's this guy's vendetta against this motorcycle man? I don't know. He just looked creepy in the in the uh, in the shadows. I guess maybe he's mad that he broke that window still and burnt him so much. So he's just going to punish this guy. <laughs> fair enough. I mean, to be fair, he's going to be burning forever. It's true. There's sort of an investigation to this man's death, but it's just kind of like there's no. They're just like, well, I guess he's dead now. And there's like a weird thing where they have where Mike and uh, Rice have a quick conversation about just like. Why don't we just tell everybody that vampires exist so they can protect themselves from vampires? And Rice is like, what? Do you want the church to run the government? That's crazy. No way. Yeah. And they're also kind of they make this argument that uh, uh, they can't tell people. It, it's I think the same argument they used in uh, Threshold when we watched that series, sort of like if you tell people they'll panic and they can't handle it. So let's just hold it back from them. Yeah. Uh, Rice's big uh, fear is that the archbishop will become the prime minister. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. At any rate, uh, Rice does feel badly, though, that this man died and like just was the collateral damage of the investigation. So he goes to check on the girlfriend at the hospital so he can inform her that her boyfriend has died. But only when he gets there, there's blood on the floor, an empty neck player brace and a broken window. Yeah. And you're like, that doesn't look good. Cut to Mike's getting back to his apartment and uh, motorbike girlfriend is in there. She's been changed into a vampire saved from paralysis by grandpa vampire and she's there not to attack mike but she's there to get him to reconsider whose side he's on that he should really switch sides to the vampire team and leave behind the vampire hunting team and we should mention she's still wearing her hospital gown and they do a lot of shots of her from behind which has as you know with hospital gowns it's open in the back so you can see that her backbone has been severed and broken, but it's been reattached somewhere, but it's all like kind of sticking out of her back and it's all jagged to show that the vampires have magically put her back back together. Like, yeah, I think the idea is if she had stayed a human, she would have been in a terrible pain the rest of her life. And look at her now, like vampires are pretty good. Wouldn't you agree, Mike? Look at me now. (laughs) Yeah, and they have this sort of argument, but pretty quickly he's basically like, nah, and then she's like, well, I guess I'm going to attack you then. Does she attack him? I thought I, what I thought happened was, they're having this 
kind of discussion and then like out of the shadows like rice snuck into the house somehow yeah i mean i thought she was maybe being a little aggressive but i guess you're right she never overtly made any attack but yes while they're talking von rice comes out of the shadows stabs her in the back and she gets to do that little uh mini supernova thing as we've seen but it really makes an effect it like blows up his apartment yeah this was the first time too where when she dies in the supernova the windows blow out of his apartment they have to hide under the couch to survive and i believe they even say at the end of the episode it's like well i guess you gotta move now yeah that's it like his his apartment's wrecked and and as we know he's not getting his deposit back no not at all and that's sort of the end of the episode before we wrap it up you mentioned this last time the idea that there's like this running c plot with the fiance jack's fiance christy from last episode and throughout this entire episode there is this running c plot of jack's fiance christy just wandering through the city trying to trying to get to the truth she wants to know what happened to her fiance and Mm -hmm. she confronts mike a couple times he hymns and haws about it and finally kind of like is like oh maybe i will tell you let's get together next week and or tomorrow and i'll talk to you about it but once he sees how dangerous she's in i guess because motorcycle boyfriend and motorcycle girlfriend ended up dead at the end of this episode he kind of does that thing that you see you see it more often at the end of a tv series or a movie where someone doesn't want the dog to follow them home so he drops them off the side of the road and says (laughs) you're a bad dog leave me alone and the dog is sad but he does that with a human being yeah that's right yeah he sort of is is very mean to her so that she won't uh you know she'll stop investigating and there's you know there's scenes of like her following him and blah 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 but i think in this episode we do find out that he eventually does sort of cop up and admit that he's now working with these people but that's all the information she gets right yeah that's as much as she gets and that like he wants her to leave him alone forever like leave me alone yeah but you know she's gonna be back in episode three who could who could let that go (laughs) yeah anyway but yeah that's that's kind of the first two episodes i think we like breeze through them pretty quickly but that's the general gist of kind of how how they play out i don't know what are your final kind of thoughts before we get into the ratings on these I was surprised at the tone of the show and not in a bad way. Uh, It just, I don't know if it's because it's a British show. It felt fresh and new and interesting, even though this show is 12 years old at this point. I really thought it was a a fun kind of new take on vampires. I'm going to blow your mind. What? 22 years ago. Oh, 1998. You know, I forget what time we are. 1998. Holy moly. 22 years ago. I got to say too, that was something I was, was impressed about in these first two episodes. I was just like, for a genre that, especially now in 2020, feels done to death, surprisingly fresh. I agree, yeah, yeah. I guess that's a good uh, segue to us rating this thing. What do you want to give the first episode, Habeas Corpus? I thought it was a pretty good pilot. I did like the second episode better, but I'm going to give this a pretty good score, I think, for a pilot. And they had a lot of uh, balls to kind of uh, juggle for this one. I'm going to give it a 7 out of 10. Yeah, I totally agree. It was It's tough to do a pilot. I don't think it quite... I don't think it fully expressed the tone that the show was going to be, but it still was Agreed. interesting enough for me to follow along. I'm going to give it a seven as well. And what do you think for the second episode? In nomina patris, in the name of the father? No, is that what it was called? Yeah. I think I, I wrote down the wrong. I think I wrote down the wrong title. In nomina patris. Yeah, it's part of the Trinitarian formula. It's part of the what? The Trinitarian far- formula, you know, in the name of the father, the son, the Holy Ghost. <laughs> you know what? I was going to ask you, actually, since you seem to be an expert on... Uh, variations within the catholic church (laughs) that is my what what sect is what sect is the father from father pierce i'm pretty sure he's supposed to be roman catholic cool that'd be my guess all right anyway my rating for episode two you were dead on the money when you said do am i going to enjoy a show about investigations yeah with stakeouts and trying to follow the money like where did it come from where did it go just financial crimes 100 percent do I think it's better than the first episode? I think it's, I actually felt almost the same. I'm going with a seven here as well. I'm going to give it a 7.5. I liked it a little bit better. I felt like I, I knew the characters a little bit more and I get the feel what the show is going to be. So I'm really hoping that every episode is going to get a little bit better. Uh, but I, I really like these two episodes. I thought it, I was surprised at how good it was. I mean, it might be just the bias of us coming back from a, from a hiatus from doing this show, but it, it could was, be. these were nice little treats. We've said it before. Sometimes we get lucky and we watch some uh, surprisingly good shows or just episodes or they're fun. And sometimes we have to watch things where you go, geez, this is this is really bad. But this was a show where I was like, yeah, I could have actually watched this at the time and really enjoyed it. 
Well, that about wraps up for the episode. Uh, thanks for joining us, listener. If you've got thoughts, if you've seen Ultraviolet, if you remember it, uh, you can write us at continuumdrag at gmail.com. And, of course, we'll have some uh, little, you know, images and gifts from the show. People supernovaing, uh, vampire bites, I don't know, stuff. We'll find stuff, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Continuum Drag. That about wraps it up, Jordan. I'll see you next week. See you then. Continuum Drag is recorded in Toronto, Ontario. Theme music by James Rex Seedler, produced by Jordan Dulloch and Luke Black. Special thanks to Aaron Hughes.